These are the seven most important algorithms you have to know if you're preparing for coding interviews. We'll start off with the three search algorithms, binary search, depth first search, and breadth first search. Then we'll take a look at the three sorting algorithms, insertion sort, merge sort, and quick sort. Lastly, we'll take a look at a special type of algorithm called a greedy algorithm. We'll be covering what each algorithm is and giving a visual demonstration, explaining when to use them, and discussing how efficient they are. Quick note, you should understand basic data structures before learning these algorithms. If you don't know the data structures or need a refresher, check out this video here first, linked in the description below. Knowing time complexity will also help you during this video, so for a quick two minute recap, check out this video. Let's not waste any more time and get right into it. Binary search is a search algorithm that is used to find the position of a specific element in a sorted list. I find it's best explained with an example, so here's a visual demonstration and an example to go with it. Let's say we were playing a guessing game with a friend, where your friend chooses a number from 1 to 100, and you have to guess what that number is. With each guess, your friend will tell you if the correct number is higher or lower than the one you guessed. One possible way of guessing is to start at 1 and go up by 1 each time until you guess it. This is called linear search. While this would work well if the number was close to 1, imagine if the correct number was all the way at 100. It would take 100 guesses to get the correct answer. On top of that, what if our guessing range was instead between 1 and 10,000? As you can see, this becomes inefficient when scaled, which is not optimal for a computer algorithm. This algorithm has a runtime of O of n. Now, let's take a look at a different way of guessing the number between 1 and 100. Instead of starting at 1, let's start right in the middle, at 50. Now, when our friend tells us if the correct answer is higher or lower, we are getting rid of half of the possible numbers to guess. We can keep guessing the middle number of the remaining possibilities, and eventually we reach our answer. This algorithm has a runtime of O of log base 2 of n, commonly written as just O of log n. Let's compare this to the linear search algorithm we just looked at before, but this time with a range of 1 to 10,000. Well, let's look at the worst case scenario, which is when the number is 10,000. For linear search, it's pretty clear how long that would take. 10,000 guesses. We start at 1 and go all the way through to 10,000. But what about for binary search? Feel free to try it yourselves, but I'm going to go ahead and instead use binary search as time complexity, which we know is O of log n. So, log base 2 of 10,000 comes out to 13.3, so it would take 14 guesses to reach the worst case. That's much better than the 10,000 guesses linear search took us. So there we go, that's binary search. It's a pretty simple algorithm that you've probably used in real life to sort through a sorted list of things. The important thing to remember here is that it only works when the list is sorted. If you ever see a sorted list that requires you to find a specific element, binary search is usually a good place to start. If you've reached this point in the video, don't click off now because these next two search algorithms are the most important to know. Depth first search, and the one we'll look at next, breadth first search, are two algorithms used to search through trees and graphs, which as you might remember from the software engineering interview process video, are the most common questions asked at interviews just behind arrays. So yeah, they're extremely important. We'll be starting with depth first search, commonly referred to as DFS. The idea with DFS is to start at the root node and go as far down one branch as possible, all the way to the end. Once we hit the deepest point, which is where the depth part of DFS comes from, we come back to an unvisited branch and go down that one. This process of coming back to an unvisited branch is called backtracking. Here's a visual demonstration of how we might traverse through this graph using DFS. Before doing any type of DFS, we want to create a visited array that keeps track of nodes we've already visited. To begin the DFS, first we'll start at the root node, 
and go down the first branch to the next node. We'll also add both the root node and the next node to our visited array. From here, we continue going down this same branch, adding each node we hit along the way to our visited array. Once we reach the bottom, we backtrack up to the previous node and see if there are any unvisited nodes we can go through. As you can see, there is one, so we'll go down to it and add it to the visited array. Now we can backtrack to the previous node again. Do we have any more unvisited nodes here? No, so we backtrack up again. We repeat this process of traversing unvisited nodes and backtracking up until we've gone through the entire graph. One real life example of where depth first search might be useful is for solving a maze, which is actually where they were originally created for. Starting from the entrance of the maze, we look through each path all the way to the very end to see if it contains the exit. If we hit a wall, we backtrack to the nearest opening and continue. The time complexity for this algorithm is given a notation of O of V plus E, where V represents total nodes, aka vertices, and E represents total branches, aka edges. We'll explore the why behind this a bit more in a video dedicated solely to depth first search. But for now, all you need to know is that the runtime is big O of V plus E. Now, let's move on to DFS's counterpart. Now that we've covered DFS, breadth first search, commonly referred to as BFS, will be a bit easier to understand. In BFS, Instead of going all the way down each branch and backtracking up, we'll look at every node at one level before continuing further down. Let's look at a visual demonstration. As was the case with depth first search, for breadth first search, we will also create a visited array to keep track of what nodes we've already visited. We'll also be creating a neighbors queue, which we'll add all neighbors of a node to. To begin with BFS, we start at the root node, add it to the visited array, and we'll add all of the nodes it's connected to, to the neighbors queue. We'll then take a look at the first node in the neighbors queue, mark it as visited, and add all of its direct neighbors to the end of the queue. This process continues, and as you can see, we'll have visited each node on the first level before we progress down to the next level of nodes. One real life example of where breadth first search is used is for chess algorithms. For those of you who don't know what this is, it's where a computer program predicts what the next best move is for any given point in a game. The way they work is by starting at a certain player's turn and taking a look at each possible move they have next. The algorithm looks at all possible moves for the next turn and then looks at all possible moves from all of those possible moves. As I'm hoping you can start to see, this is just depth first search, where the nodes are moves and the levels are turns. Just like with depth first search, the runtime for this algorithm is also O of V plus E. Again, this will be covered more in depth in a dedicated video to breadth first search, but we'll save that for another day. And there we go, we've covered all three search algorithms. Next, we're gonna cover the three sorting algorithms. But before I do, just a quick ask. If you're enjoying this video, please like, subscribe, and share it with friends. I'm usually putting 12 to 20 hours into each video and trying to balance that with a full-time schedule sometimes requires me to stay up until 2, 3, even 4 a.m. to get videos done. I'd love to keep making more and more videos, so I'd really appreciate it if you could share these videos with anyone you know. Thanks so much, and let's continue with the algorithms. Sorting algorithms are used to sort lists of elements, usually in ascending order. There are tons of different types of sorting algorithms, but today we're looking at the three most important for interviews. Insertion and sort is the first of the sorting algorithms and the easiest to start with. Insertion and sort works as follows. The algorithm looks at the first element in the list and compares it with the second. If the second is less than the first, swap the two. Then, compare the element in the second position with the element in the third position. If the third element is less than the second element, swap the two. If this element is also smaller than the first element, swap them again. 
As you can see, we'll continue with this pattern until we reach the end, and voila, we have a sorted list of elements now. Insertion sort is a simple sorting algorithm, and that's where its limitations are. Insertion sort has a best case runtime of O of n, and a worst case runtime of O of n squared. It is O of n when everything is already sorted, as it only goes through each element, and O of n squared when nothing is sorted, because it has to go through every element times the total number of elements. As a result, insertion sort is best used for lists that are already mostly sorted, or for lists of smaller sizes. Once the lists grow larger and more unordered, the O of n squared runtime starts to become problematic. Now, let's take a look at a sorting algorithm that might be better for large lists. Merge sort is a sorting algorithm that falls under the category of divide and conquer algorithms because it breaks up the problem into smaller problems and solves each smaller problem. Does this sound familiar to you? Well, if you watch my video explaining recursion, I hope you recognize that this is actually a recursive algorithm. As per usual, let's look at a visualization for this. We start by splitting the array in half, and we continue to split each subarray in half until the array has been split into pairs. Then, at the same time, each pair is going to do a comparison of the first element and the second element, and swap them if the second is greater than the first. Now we have sorted pairs. The next thing our algorithm does is combine two sets of pairs and do the exact same thing as before, sorting the numbers for each group of four. This process continues all the way back up until we reach the full array, which is now sorted. Merge sort has a runtime of O of n log n in the best and worst cases. Comparing that to insertion sort, we can sort of see when you might want to use one over the other. For smaller, already somewhat sorted lists, insertion has a runtime closer to O of n, whereas merge sort is O of n log n, so that's where we might want to use insertion sort. For larger, less sorted lists, insertion sort has a runtime closer to O of n squared, whereas merge sort remains at O of n log n, so that's where we might want to use merge sort. I'm hoping this is all making sense so far, and you're understanding how the algorithms work, and when we might want to use one over the other. Now, time to look at our last sorting algorithm. Quicksort is our final sorting algorithm, and the most complicated of the three. However, once you understand how the other two work, it becomes a lot easier, which is why I left it for last. Like merge sort, Quicksort is a divide and conquer algorithm and is recursive. The idea is to pick a pivot number, ideally as close to the median of the list as possible, and split the list into two lists, one where all the numbers are less than the pivot and one where all the numbers are greater than the pivot. We continue this process on each sublist until we've reached our sorted list. Let's look at the visualization for it. We start with our list and try to pick a number close to the median. Once we've selected that number, we move it to the end of the list. Now, we place a pointer at the leftmost element and the rightmost element, and we compare the two. If the leftmost element is greater than the pivot, and the rightmost element is less than the pivot, we swap them. Otherwise, we leave them as is. We continue through the list until our pointers cross. Once they do, we replace the element at the left pointer with our pivot. Now, everything before our pivot is less than the pivot, and everything after our pivot is greater. We will do the same process on both of these lists now, choosing a median pivot for both and sorting the same way. Once we finish, the list is completely sorted. Quicksort has a best case runtime of O of n log n, but a worst case runtime of O of n squared. You might be wondering why we would ever use this algorithm, as it has a worse time complexity than both of our previous sorting algorithms. Well, this is where it gets interesting and a little bit complicated. Quicksort, when implemented correctly, is actually the fastest of the three on average. 
The complexities behind it are better saved for another video. But for a simple reason, the code in the inner loop of the quicksort algorithm can be optimized to significantly reduce probability of worst case and is on average two to three times faster than merge sort. On top of all of that, quicksort has a space complexity of O of log n, whereas merge sort has a space complexity of O of n, so quicksort is a bit better for the memory. However, one of the largest drawbacks to quicksort is that all of this relies on the code being optimized. Any little mistake or inefficiency in the quicksort code can cause the algorithm to run much slower, and it is a much harder algorithm to implement than merge sort. That wraps up our sorting algorithms. Before this video ends, I want to take a look at one more type of algorithm, which is a special type of algorithm. When you think of someone being greedy, what do you think of? Usually, it's someone who always wants and does what the best thing for themselves is in any scenario. Well, that's exactly what this algorithm does. Greedy algorithms are algorithms that make the best possible choice at every local decision point. Put more simply, every time they have to make a decision, they just look at what the next best move is without looking too much into the future. We're first going to look at when not to use greedy algorithms, and then when you should use them. Greedy algorithms are not used for efficiency, because typically, they're not looking at every possible outcome, just the best outcome at each stage. Here's an example of where a greedy algorithm doesn't work optimally. Consider this scenario. For each decision you make here, you have to spend a certain amount of money indicated by the number on the path. Think for a moment, what should you do? Hopefully you came up with this path as the correct solution. However, using a greedy algorithm, we might not get this. The algorithm first looks at the first two choices, seven and eight. It chooses what's best right then, which is a seven and moves on. From here, it looks at its next two choices, nine and 10. Again, it chooses what's best in the moment, which is a nine, and reaches the end. The algorithm reached the end spending $16 total. But if we did it ourselves, we could reach the end spending $3 only. So why ever use them if they're inefficient? Well, for a scenario like the one above, we could have easily developed a DFS or BFS algorithm to find the optimal solution. That's because the problem is simple enough for a computer to solve it that way. In fact, we could even brute force it and have the computer calculate every possible outcome. But what happens when we have impossibly large amounts of outcomes to go through? Sometimes, even modern day computing can't go through every single scenario to get the optimal answer. This is where greedy algorithms are used. If you can't get the exact right answer using an optimized algorithm, it's best to use a greedy algorithm and get something that's relatively close, even if not 100% accurate. One of the most famous examples of this is called the traveling salesman problem. This problem provides a list of cities and distances between each city and asks for the shortest possible route that visits each city once and returns to the origin city. The formula for total possible routes is n minus one factorial divided by two. If our salesman wanted to visit five cities, that gives us 12 possible routes. If our salesman wanted to visit twice the amount of cities, 10 cities, that gives us 181,440 possible routes. Just doubling our city number gives us an exponential growth in route possibilities. But still, 181,440 routes can be solved by a computer in mere milliseconds. Now, let's consider that the traveling salesman wants to visit every capital city in every US state. As there are 50 US states, that gives us 50 total cities. Take a guess as to what the possible root count is. A few million? Maybe into the billions or trillions? Well, if you guessed anywhere near there, you're not even close, because the total number of roots is this. Yeah. And while a supercomputer might be able to calculate that one day, 
that's only 50 cities. Just for fun, let's say it was 1000 cities. Ready for the number? As you can see, we definitely won't be finding the exact optimal route from every possible route. Here's where our friend the greedy algorithm comes in. Let's choose an arbitrary starting city and write a simple algorithm that always chooses the next city that's the least far away. We can continue this process until we reach the end and then return to our starting city. This is definitely not the most efficient way to do it, but as we've seen, we can't calculate the most efficient solution, and we'll still get an answer that is far more efficient than randomly choosing cities. So to summarize all of that, greedy algorithms are used when finding the optimal solution might not be possible, so we want something that's relatively accurate. Those are the seven most important algorithms for interviews. This is my longest video yet and took the most amount of time to make. So if you could smash the like button and share this video, I'd really appreciate it. I put a ton of effort into these videos and I'd love it if as many people as possible could see them and learn from them. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next video.